Today's lecture is um, something to do with um, midbrain legends. You know, as I told you before, I discuss the legends concerning the entire brainstem, where I also discuss the medulla oblongata legion and also discuss the legion regarding the pons. So today I'm going to discuss midbrain legions as well as spinal cord legions. So in the midbrain alone, we have about four to five legions, which I'm going to discuss some of them, not all per se. And we have what we call dorsal and ventral part of the midbrain legions. And so before I now start discussing what is happening with the midbrain when you have some, you know, disturbances along the architecture of the midbrain, I think we should just briefly discuss about the anatomy of the midbrain briefly. You are aware that midbrain can be sectioned at two various levels: level of the superior colloculus level and also level of the inferior colloculus level. So you can have different structures at these two sections. At the level of the superior colloculi section of the midbrain, you are going to see superior colloculi, and then you are going to see the third cranial nerve, that is the oculomotor nerve, together with one important nucleus, what you call red nucleus on either side. So these are the two or three most important structures that you can find at the level of the superior section of the middle brain at the level of the superior colloculi. When you now section the middle brain at the level of the inferior colloculi, what you are going to see, you are going to see the superior the inferior colloculi nuclei and as well as the nuclei of the trochlear nerves. You know the trochlear nerve is the fourth cranial nerve. So it is only nuclei are located at the lower level of the midbrain. While the nuclei of the oculomotor nerve, three, four, because three comes before four, right? So the nuclei of the third cranial nerve are found at the level of the superior colloculi. You get it? So now at the level of the superior colloculi section of the midbrain, you are going to see this uh, superior colloculi nuclei. You have one on the left side and the other one on the right side. Similarly, you know, we have central canal, you know, whereby you have a peri you know, uh, gray matter there surrounding the central canal. So on the anterior aspect of the peri gray matter, you have the nuclei of the oculomotor nerve. And just behind the nuclei of the oculomotor nerve, you have another nucleus on either side, what we call Edinger Westphal nucleus. This Edinger Westphal nucleus, I, I'm sure you are aware that it, it is on fibers, you know, go into the substance of the oculomotor nerve to go and supply certain structures in the eye, especially the pupil and the ciliary muscles. Whereas the oculomotor nerve supplies our extraocular muscles, you are all aware of that, you get it? With the exception of one of them, that is the lateral rectus and the superior oblique muscles, which are supplied by different cranial nerves. Now we know that. So just the oculomotor nerve, it is on oculomotor nuclei. The fibers of these neurons in the oculomotor nucleus, the fibers, they come forward and pass through the red nucleus of it is on site. And so this, the, both the fibers of the Edinger's nucleus and the fibers of the oculomotor nerve, all these fibers, they bundle together and go through the oculomotor nerve. So oculomotor nerve is a combination of both axons of neurons of the oculomotor nerve nucleus as well as the axons of the neurons of the Edinger's nucleus. So they bundle together and go as oculomotor nerve. This oculomotor nerve, as it comes forward on either side, it passes through the red nucleus, and then it comes out into the interpeduncular fossa. Are you clear? And so if you can remember generally the midbrain when you suction it, at either level you are going to see that the midbrain is divided into three components. We have what we call basic pedunculi, whereby you have at the base of or the ventral portion of the midbrain, you have what you call the cerebral peduncles on either side. 
So this cerebral peduncles constitute the base of the middle brain. That is what we call the basi pedunculi. Similarly, just behind the basi pedunculi, we have the tegmentum. This tegmentum now is the larger chunk of the uh, middle brain. And then at the back of it, where you have either the superior colloculus or the inferior colloculus, then you have the uh, tectum. So the tectum, te tectum constitutes the superior colloculi and the inferior colloculi at the superior or inferior level of the middle brain. So again, within the substance of the tectum, you have what you call the lamellisci. If you can remember your neuroanatomy very well, we have four different lamellisci bundled together in the middle brain. So on either side, you have the, this four lamellisci there. So now the basis of all the reasons for making this is to make you understand the different lesions that I'm going to discuss now. So now, since we have already seen the anatomy of the middle brain, now we have about three different lesions involving the uh, middle brain. So now what are the lesions involving the ventral aspect of the middle brain? We have what we call stage Weber syndrome, we have Claudius syndrome, and then we have Benedict syndrome. These three syndromes, they affect the ventral part of the middle brain. Now, the middle brain lesions, as I told you, are divided into two parts. Lesions involving the ventral part of the middle brain, lesions involving the dorsal part of the middle brain. So you may have lesion involving the basic pedunculi, or cetactum, or the tegmentum. So it can affect the basic peduncul uh, pedunculi, the tectum, or the tegmentum, or the tectum. So these are the three different. So the tegmentum and the basic pedunculi constitute the ventral part of the middle brain, while the tectum constitute the dorsal part of the middle brain. So now in the ventral part of the middle brain, that is the basic pedunculi and the tegmentum, we have about three different syndromes, what we call Stoge Weber syndrome or Weber syndrome. We also have what we call Claudius syndrome, and then we have what we call Benedict syndrome. If you now take Weber syndrome, in the Weber syndrome now it affects mainly the basic pedunculi. And if you can remember your anatomy very well, in the basic pedunculi there, you have your corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts coming from both the cerebral, uh, uh, from the, 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 the cerebral cortex. That means from both the somatosensory cortex and the primary motor cortex and the premotor cortex or areas. So they now descend down into the middle part of the basic pedunculi. This is the area where you have your corticospinal and corticobulbar fibers, you understand. So now, once this busy pedunculi are affected, you get it. If you can remember, the oculomotor now passes through the red nucleus and comes out of the middle brain on the ventral portion through the inter pedunculi fossa. So if there is a lesion along that side, this cranial nerve of that side, the detached cranial nerve of that side, is also going to be affected. So that means the basic pedunculus of one side plus the oculomotor nerve of that same side is going to be affected with regard to the Stoge Weber syndrome. Now, what are the clinical features of somebody that has this Stoge Weber syndrome or, and what are the causes of this Stoge Weber syndrome? So this Stoge Weber syndrome can be caused by several you know, conditions, like what we call multiple sclerosis, you get it, or maybe occlusion of the artery supply on that side, or maybe trauma or tumor. You understand all this can cause the, you know, the ventral portion of the midbrain to cause this stage Weber syndrome. So the structures that are affected include the corticospinal tract, corticobulbar tract that are located in the middle part of the cortical. Uh, of the middle part of the busy pedunculi. And here, you know, on the medial side and on the lateral side, you have fibers coming from the other part of the cerebral cortex. But the most important features that one can present is 
with this structure uh, related to this structure that is called spinal tract and cortical bulbar fibers. So also cranial nerve, cervical nerve, cranial nerve is going to be affected. So these are the three important structures that are affected in Stoge Weber syndrome. So because of the involvement of the cortical spinal tract, since you know that as soon as these cortical spinal fibers they descend down from the cerebral cortex to the brainstem. They descend down into the medulla oblongata while they crisscross. Left goes to the right, and the right goes to the left. So now, since there's involvement of this corticospinal fibers and corticobulbar fibers of one side, if this is the left side, so as they go down, you know they crisscross to the left side. So that means that's what you call contralateral loss of motor function. Why contralateral is because of the cessation of those fibers when they reach medulla oblongata. So that's what you call a contralateral loss of motor function, and that is what you call hemiplegia because it is in the middle brain. So both upper and the lower limb function are going to be affected. So there's paralysis of the upper motor and the lower motor, uh, upper, 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 upper limb and the lower limb. So which is of the upper motor neuron type. So that's upper motor neuron legion of one side. Hemiplegia upper limb and the lower limb are going to be paralyzed with regard to the features of the upper motor neuron paralysis. There's also hemianesthesia because of the embellishment of these uh, fibers coming down from the postcentral gyrus descending, uh, 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 coming into the postcentral gyrus through that side. So again, we also have contralateral lower face palsy. That means the lower part of the face you know, it's also going to be affected from this upper motor because of this embodiment of the corticobulbar, you know, fibers coming from the uh, 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 premotor and motor cortex, you know. And also there is embodiment of the tongue, you know, of that side. And also that, that opposite side, sorry. There is also embodiment of the cranial nerve whereby you have features related to the paralysis of the third cranial nerve. If you can remember, we said, or oh, I said that <coughs> the third cranial nerve supplies our extraocular muscles, our superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, you know, superior palpebrae, libido palpebrae, superioris, you understand. And so now, that's what you call ipsilateral succinct, because you know the oculomotor nerve doesn't crisscross. So, that oculomotor now, if it is the left side that's affected, so there's involvement of the eye on the left side, that means it's lateral, same side. So because of the involvement of that side cranial now of that same side, there is it's lateral squint, what you call lateral squint. I've discussed several varieties of the squint in my previous videos. So we have what you call lateral squint, medial squint, and what have you. So the, we have what you call it's lateral squint, which is lateral so can, because there's an opposed action or function of the lateral rectus of the extraocular muscle because the third nerve supplies all the, 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 the other muscles. So once they are paralyzed, the lateral rectus is going to take action or take over the function of the movement of the eye. So it is going to move the eye on the lateral side. So there is lateral succinct. There is also tosis, that means drooping of the eyelid. So the upper eyelid is going to drop down. So it's going to close because the that now all the oculomotor nerve supplies the levator palpebrae superioris that elevates the eyelid. So since it is now paralyzed, then there is dropping of the eyelid down to cover the eye. That is what you call ptosis. Similarly, there is also what you call pupillary dilatation, and the pupil is going to be fixed after dilatation. Why? Because of this involvement of Edinger westerpal nucleus. If you can remember here at the back of the oculomotor nerve, there is Edinger westerpal nucleus there responsible for the parasympathetic supply to the pupils and also supplying the ciliary muscles. So as a result of that, instead of constricting the eye, the, the, the iris, since it is now paralyzed, then there is dilatation of, so opposite action, action is going to take place. So there is dilatation of the pupil and also the pupil is going to be fixed. There's also going to be loss of accommodation. Accommodation is like you are able to focus an object at various distances. For example, now, if I keep this marker in front of you, you see the marker clearly. If I move it further, you also see it clearly. If I move it further, 
you see it clearly. If I draw it closer again towards your eyes, you still see it and you see it clearly. That's what we call accommodation. If you are able to focus an object at various distances with a clear vision, that is what we call accommodation. Are you clear? So somebody with this problem, this Weber syndrome, that is what you call loss of accommodation. At any distance you put this image, that person is not going to focus that image clearly, even though you see in the image, but the image is not going to be clear because the accommodation is lost. As a result of this paralysis of the iris, uh, uh, ciliary muscles that has been supplied by the fibers from the Edinger Westerfall nucleus. Are you all clear? So these are the features of the Stojuweber or Weber syndrome. We can call it Stojuweber, Stojuweber syndrome. S-T-U-R-G-E. It's the name of a person. What you just call is Weber syndrome. Anyone is, 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 is accepted. This, these are the features, you know, and the structures involved with regard to Stoji Weber syndrome. The second syndrome is what we call a cloudy syndrome. Cloudy syndrome involves only the red nucleus and part of the oculomotor nerve that is passing through the red nucleus. So this is just as a result of, you know, certain diseases, all this multiple sclerosis and what have you, and maybe tumors and so on and so forth. They can affect the red nucleus as well as the oculomotor nerve that passes through it. If you can rem remember your neuroanatomy very well, there are also fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncles that also penetrate within the substance of the red nucleus. So also those fibers are also going to be affected. So we have three important structures that are affected in the cloudy syndrome. There you have third cranial nerve, that is the oculomotor nerve, passing through the red nucleus. Also the red nucleus is also involved and also fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncles. All these three structures are going to be involved with regard to this cloudy syndrome. So once that happens, you are going to see features of involvement of the third cranial nerve. What are these features which I've already made mention? There is ipsilateral, you know, uh, ipsilateral uh, sequent. That means we have lateral sequent. We also have ptosis as a result of this uh, paralysis of the levator palpebrae superioris. There is also dilatation of the pupil because there is no longer construction of the pupil as a result of the supply from the Edinger Westphal nucleus. And also there is also loss of accommodation of the eye as a result of the paralysis of the ciliary muscle being supplied by the Edinger Westphal nucleus. These are the features of the sari cranial nerve involvement with regard to the cloudy syndrome. Similarly, the red nucleus is involved. You know, red nucleus is also responsible for the maintenance of our own coordination of our motor movement. You get it? So that one is also going to be involved. There's also uh, irregularly, uh, uh, a problem with maintenance or regulation of our motor movement. And also because there is involvement of the superior cerebellar peduncle fibers, that's what we call cerebellar ataxia. That means somebody who just be swaying as he is walking around, you get it. When you stand up, you, when the person stands up, the person would be swaying on either side. That's what we call cerebellar ataxia because of this fibrous superior cerebellar peduncle passing through the red nucleus. So these are the features of the cloudy syndrome. The third one, which is the Benedict syndrome, is combination of both Weber syndrome and cloudy syndrome. So in that scenario, both basic pedunculi of one side, basic pedunculus of one side, and also the red nucleus plus the oculomotor now are going to be involved. So automatically this portion is going to be affected. That means the basic pedunculus as well as the red nucleus and oculomotor now of that side are going to be affected. That means it's a combination of both Weber syndrome and cloudy syndrome. Also, all these structures that are in the Weber syndrome that are affected, and also structures that are affected in the cloudy syndrome are all affected in Benedict syndrome. And that is why you have features related to both the two syndromes. So you can develop or, you know, uh, see, you can, you know, you can be able to write the features of the Benedict syndrome. So you have a combination of all this in, with regard to the Benedict syndrome. But with regard to the perineal syndrome, that is the dorsal syndrome, dorsal midbrain syndrome, that is what we call perineal syndrome. Perineal syndrome now, it involves the colloculi. 
if it is at the superior curricular level, you are going to see features with regard to, because you know that superior curriculum is responsible for, you know, you know, uh, related to the visions, vision. So you are going to have diplopia, nystagmus, papillary dilatation, and also uh, sunset side. What do you mean by sunset side? You see the eyes are coming down, you know, as if the sun, when the sun is setting, you see that it is going down into the sky like that. Almost half, it, half of the sun is just going down. The same thing with this uh, uh, perineal syndrome, you see the eyeball now, you know, the black portion of the eye is half of it is down. You get it so that it appears as if the sun is setting. Something like that. So you have this diplopia double fishing. You have nystagmus, that is oscillation of the eye. If the person wants to gaze upward, for example, now you ask the person to look at this marker. I put this marker up. You ask him to look at it up like this. That is what we mean by upward gaze. The person's eye is going to start oscillating. So the person will never be able to get this marker upward. So the, as soon as that person tries to gaze or to look upward for this marker, the eye will drop down and start oscillating. That is what we call upward nystagmus. The eye will be oscillating up, down, up, down. Are you clear? So these are the pictures of the perineal syndrome. But again, if it is at the level of the inferior colloculi, the inferior colloculi, you know, they are responsible for hearing. You know, so the hearing apart, the, when you are talking about the hearing pathway, you must include the inferior colloculi. So if it is at the level of the inferior colloculi, once you have the midbrain involvement at that level, so definitely the hearing is going to be, hearing level of that person is going to be affected. So I think let me just, you know, stop here for this uh, midbrain syndrome. Then I will now discuss this final code.